for 2020 to 21. Uh, this particular class is part of LLM teaching in corporate governance with Suzanne Goldson at Moon Alone. Our guest lecturer today is a very special person. Justice Andrew Burgess will lecture on the oppression remedy in Caribbean courts. It's a pleasure to have all of you, all of you who are joining us live, some of you who will watch later, uh, some of you who are uh, what I'm calling in studio with us virtually. Uh, we're very pleased to have heard of your interest from all over the Caribbean, from Anguilla, Antigua and Barbuda, the Bahamas, Barbados, Dominica, the Dutch Caribbean, Grenada, Guyana, Jamaica, Montserrat, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Trinidad and Tobago, TCI, and further afield, Canada, the UK and the US. At this moment, we are all virtually part of teaching in the one UE LLM program offered at the Mona, Cavill, and St. Augustine campuses. And this can lead to a general LLM or a specialist one in either corporate and commercial law or public law. Students enroll on any of the three campuses and have access to courses which are taught on any of the campuses. Suzanne class, Suzanne's class today has over 60 students who are enrolled at either Mona, Cavill, or St. Augustine. Uh, many are online with us today, and they come from nearly as many Caribbean countries as those above. Their varied backgrounds from private practice, working in the government service, parliamentarians, uh, some serving as general counsel, as company secretaries, and increasingly many are senior lawyers who have bravely returned to UA classrooms to do the LLM or even just to audit one of our courses. We're very pleased that you are joining us in what is our public facing class today. Uh, we're especially pleased to have in our virtual studio classroom today, Ms. Sandra Osborne, Queen's Counsel. She's one of the most experienced professionals in the field of corporate governance in the region retired a few years ago as executive vice president and corporate secretary for the Sajikor Group. She's also an accomplished sports administrator, and many of you may know of her longstanding connection to our guest lecturer. Uh, we're also pleased to have in the virtual classroom uh, judges and classmates of Justice Burgess, um, here right now, we have the Honorable Michael Hilton, a classmate, uh, the Honorable Mr. Justice Ian Winder of the Supreme Court of the Bahamas, another master class teacher, Nadia Chiesa, partner at Wearfolds LLP Toronto, is also here. Uh, Mike Hilton is also another master class teacher. And um, we're pleased to also have a number of persons now distinguished practitioners in the area of corporate and commercial law who are joining us in the virtual studio, um, as are many of you on the outside. Um, we have uh, probably from the first decade of Justice Burgess's teaching, we have Elizabeth Kelsick of Kelsick Wilkin and Ferdinand St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, the fearless very thorough commercial law litigator Sandra Minot Phillips of Miles Fletcher and Gordon. Uh, we'll be joined by another former student, John Jeremy, uh, the acting dean at the St. Augustine campus of the Faculty of Law. And probably from his last decade of teaching in the Faculty of Law, we have Kristen Turton from KCT Chambers in Barbados. Today's a special lecture because 50 years ago, Come October, September, I'm not sure when you started Justice Burgess, in what might have been the Michaelmas term or semester um, term, the Barbadian Harrison College graduate Andrew Derrick Burgess became a fresher, a fresher at the year old Faculty of Law just established at Cavill. 
he would have very quickly met those who were there for the inception of the faculty in 1970. Cecil Dennis Morrison, also known as linguist, whom Adrian Saunders describes as the best graduate in the 50 year history of the faculty. Norma Ford Barbadian, another prominent member of that class. Dominican Antiguan, former Attorney General Justin Simon, uh, the first PhD graduate from the Faculty of Law, Jamaican Eileen Boxhill, the former principal of the Norman Manley Law School, the late Trinidadian Keith Sobian. Derek McCoy was in that first group. But joining Andrew Burgess, also as a fresher in 1971, would have been the incomparable corporate law litigator and another masterclass teacher, B. St. Michael Hilton, Queen's Council. They would have also been joined by Dorcas White, senior tutor emerita at the Norman Manley Law School, and they would have met and welcomed the following year persons like Adrian Saunders. All these men and women went on and continued to lead Caribbean courts and Caribbean legal education. Professor Andrew Burgess, among other things, became a legendary lecturer in contract, tort, revenue, company law, among others. I wasn't taught by him, but I have the privilege of having been his colleague for more than a decade. He was my first boss at the University of the West Indies. In those days, if you were searching for Andrew Burgess, you might check at home, you might check in the faculty, but your best bet might be to check the tennis courts probably at Paragon. Um, if he could have conducted classes on the tennis court, I think he might have. And in fact, I think for some of his students, uh, his classes certainly felt sometimes like brutal tennis matches. We might even say he has moved from court to court. And I won't offer a view on how those courts rank. But if you are a former student of Andrew Burgess, tell us in the chat, tell us what he taught you, tell us what he was like as a teacher. The good stuff, Andrew, <laughs> uh, Justice Burgess. Uh, I want to thank all of you who have joined us in studio, uh, students in the LLM program, as well as special invited guests, and all of you have joined us from all around the region. I want to thank, mo give thanks most to our lecturer, Justice Andrew Burgess, and I want to immediately hand over to the now familiar corporate law pairing of Suzanne Folks golson course director, and Dr. Celia Brown-Blake, both former students of Justice Burgess, to get us started. Sir. Thank you so much. Um, I had to find a way to get myself unmuted. So thank you so much, Tracy. And welcome to all our participants on Zoom and on YouTube. Um, may I introduce, um, as Tracy has mentioned, my colleague and co-moderator, Dr. Celia Brown-Blake, Senior Lecturer at Mona Law, who also specializes in corporate law, corporate governance, and corporate insolvency. Um, and so welcome, Celia, and thank you for joining me um, in what we anticipate to be an excellent session. And it is an honor and privilege for us to welcome our former lecturer and mentor, the Honorable Mr. Justice Andrew Burgess, to lead our masterclass this afternoon. I could spend all the time speaking about his outstanding contribution to the UE Faculty of Law at Cave Hill and the influence he has had on so many of us and our careers, for which we will forever be in your debt, Andrew. However, I will leave the task of introductory remarks to my dear friend and colleague from the class of 87, Mrs. Sandra Minot Phillips, Queen's Counsel and Senior Partner at Miles Fletcher and Gordon. Over to you, Sandra. Okay, I was trying to unmute myself also. Uh, there were many benefits derived from everyone having to do second and third year, 
Faculty of Law Studies at the Cayfield campus. Not least among them was the presence there of all the best lecturers, all in one place. And that place, of course, was the Cayfield campus. Burgess, as he then was, was indisputably the best of the best. Every able civil law practitioner, academic, jurist, in the English-speaking Caribbean knows who this man is. It is therefore somewhat presumptuous of me to say I'm introducing him to you. It is because he is so well known that attendance at this masterclass has, ex has exceeded the subscription of all masterclasses in the series to date. The Honorable Mr. Justice Andrew Burgess, Barbadian native and Caribbean treasure, was sworn in as a CCJ judge two years ago in January 2019. Prior to that, he was a Court of Appeal judge in Barbados, a judge of the World Bank Administrative Tribunal, a judge and eventually president of the Inter-American Development Bank's Administrative Tribunal in Washington, D.C., and dean of the Faculty of Law at U.S. Cayville campus. And these were just a few of the hats he wore. I dare say, however, that it is as professor stroke lecturer stroke teacher extraordinaire that he has secured his place in the hearts and minds of his devotee massive. Before the emergence of social media influencers, we in our day had real influencers who affected the tradition the trajectory of people's lives positively. I do not disrespect his office when I refer to him as Burgess because he has earned his place among the few iconic figures who are referred to and known by a single name. In my era at the Faculty of Law at Cayfield, Burgess taught revenue and equity too his knowledge of the civil law of the UK and of the English-speaking Caribbean is so encyclopedic, however, that the chair he eventually assumed was as, of, was as professor of corporate and commercial law. Burgess was unorthodox in how he went about getting the job done, but get it done, he did, with every class, year on year. His knowledge came across as innate. You never saw him checking lecture notes or reaching for information. He just knew the stuff. He spoke easily, authoritatively, and seemingly effortlessly. I say seemingly effortlessly because in reality, we all know a trailer load of work goes into producing something that is seemingly effortless. Just ask Bolt or Burishnikov or Burgess. Burgess didn't so much teach you the law as teach you how to learn the law with well-timed guidance and redirection when needed. He is the most economical conveyor of information I have ever known. He gave only as many lectures as was absolutely necessary for him to convey the material. His standout ability was that of taking the time to convey twice the information, taking half the time to convey twice the information any other lecturer could. If a lecture was necessary, he would give it. If it was not, you are just as likely at the appointed hour to glimpse him lying in the senior common room or taking in the cricket at Kensington Oval. Burgess did not hide the fact that very little, if anything, came before cricket. His family, of course, did, but I don't know that any one or anything else could claim to come before cricket. Of course, in those days, West Indian cricket was worth watching. 
if the West Indies was playing in Barbados and you wanted to speak with Burgess, jump on a maxi taxi and make your way to Kensington over. Yet it was that somehow the syllabus was completed in good time and his students were fully prepped and ready for end of year exams. More importantly though, the quality of Burgess's teaching was so good that the legal fundamentals he imparted and how to think them through were not forgotten after the exams were sat and passed, but remained with us is oh so fortunate students as bedrock knowledge underpinning our legal careers that followed. That is what has produced the appreciation and reverence even that we have for this man. And so it is that I believe we are all in for a treat today as we listen to the Honorable Mr. Justice Andrew Burgess consider with us commercial litigation's latest flavor of the month, the oppression remedy. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Those words are very, very kind. I don't think that they really describe me, but nevertheless, I'll take them. Colleagues, my former students and other students of company law are present here this afternoon. Let me begin by saying what a privilege and honor it is for me to be invited to make a presentation in this masterclass. In my view, the masterclass is one of Mona Law's truly path-breaking initiatives. And I want to extend to you at Mona Law warmest congratulations on the masterclass initiative and to wish you continuing outstanding success. Now this afternoon, I've chosen the topic of this presentation, what I have titled The Oppression Remedy and the Demise of Classical Company Law Theory. Now I should, uh, at the very beginning, point out that even though the title is broad, The Oppression Remedy, I'm really talking about the oppression remedy in the Commonwealth uh, Caribbean. I should also like to state up front that there will be occasions when I'll make reference to the Jamaican Companies Act because it uh, is somewhat different from other companies act. Uh, on those occasions, uh, I would uh, appreciate the intervention of any of the Jamaican lawyers the most who could help me to um, understand the differences between the Jamaican Act and the remainder of the Commonwealth um, uh, uh, Caribbean. But later for that, you may raise the question why I have chosen this topic, the topic which I've chosen, which is the oppression remedy. Now, there are two reasons, if you raise the question, question with me, why I've chosen it. There are two reasons why I have chosen this topic. The first reason is, uh, I would say, I would, I would refer to it as uh, doctrinal. And it really uh, stems from the fact that recent regional companies legislation has broken from the age old tradition of copying English company statutes and is now rooted in Canadian legislative provisions. Now, many of the new provisions are not only new, but distinct both in character and purpose. And they represent a rejection of the classical company law theory that company law rights obligations derive from the classification of the constituent document as a contract and then uh, imposing on that structure the 
remedies for breach of contract. In my view, the oppression remedy shatters that approach to company law. And for this, that's the first reason why I would want to explore the oppression remedy from the perspective of uh, doctrine, company law doctrine. My second reason is, uh, is pragmatic, it's based on pragmatism. And I think that um, Sandra in her introduction referred to the oppression remedy as the flavor of the month. I, I, I agree with her that the remedy is very prevalent in regional company law litigation. As a matter of fact, in the last 25 years or so, the oppression remedy provision has been most, the most litigated provision in regional company law litigation. Indeed, the oppression remedy cases account for almost 50% of company law litigation in the reason. The remedy has been litigated in regional high courts all across the Caribbean and courts of appeal and in the Privy Council, as well as the CCJ. I think that for these two reasons, at least, you will readily grant me leave to have this conversation with you on this topic which I've chosen. So let's turn to the fundamentals of the oppression remedy provision. I think that the typical provision is so important that we should display it and go through it together because I think that if we plant it in our minds early in the discussion, that will be to the benefit of, of, of everyone. So I wonder whether the remedy could be displayed. The provision could be displayed. Yes, thank you very much. Now, if, if you look at it, and I would suggest to you that there are certain keywords that one should uh, underline in reading this uh, provision. Now, the section, in the section, Subsection one typically provides that a complainant may apply to the court for the, for the remedy. The, uh, subsection two usually provides that if upon the application under the section, the court is satisfied in respect of, of, of those things, those, uh, that conduct that it is oppressive, unfairly prejudicial, or that unfairly disregards the interests of any shareholder or the venture holder, creditor, director or office of a company, the company may make an order to rectify the matters complained of. I should point out to you here that the Jamaican Act uh, does not uh, contain, well, it didn't originally contain a provision for unfair disregard. You, if, you, if you look at the provision itself, uh, it says that is oppressive. This is the actionable conduct. This is conduct which um, could lead to the oppression remedy. It is oppressive or unfairly prejudicial or that unfairly disregards. The Jamaican Act, which was passed, I think, in 2006, uh, did not contain the third uh, category of actionable conduct, which is unfair disregard. But my <clears throat> good friend, uh, Suzanne, has drawn to my attention, she drew to my attention, that the unfairly disregard uh, conduct was added by the Jamaicans to their act in 2017. Now, I have a theory about the Jamaican approach to the oppression remedy. 
because when we come to look at some other parts of the of, of, of it, we'll see that the, the Jamaica is somewhat reticent in jumping deep into the oppression remedy. But we'll talk about that later on. What I'd like to, to indicate here that to better understand this oppression provision, I think that two interrelated aspects of it uh, need to be explored. The, the first relates to the provenance of the provision and the second to its theoretical foundation. So let's have a look at the uh, quick look at the historical roots of the provisions. The oppression remedy provisions trace their roots back to section 210 of the English 1948 Companies Act. Now on the, under that section, any member of a company who complained that the affairs of the company were being conducted in a manner oppressive to some part of the members could petition the court. Now, if the court was satisfied that the facts supported a winding up order under the relevant English provision on just and equitable grounds, quote and unquote, just and equitable grounds, then the court was empowered to make any order it thought fit. And I'm suggesting to you that in understanding the juridical nature of the oppression remedy, that it is critically important to remember its roots. The other thing which is very important to remember, and I think that this may have some bearing on the Jamaican uh, 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 provisions, is the theoretical foundation of the provisions. Now, let me state first of all that the oppression remedy provisions are not a codification of the common law. In my view, they represent a shattering of the traditional company law theory that the company's constating documents constituted a contract. All of us remember uh, back in the pre-modern uh, companies up, uh, looking at the whole question of the statutory uh, uh, con contract. And as we all know, the company law in England developed, especially in the latter half of the uh, 19th century, 18th century, I'm sorry. This was the heyday of classical contract theory, which colonized almost every branch of the law and succeeded in colonizing the company law theory. As a matter of fact, if you look at some of the old rules, you will see that captured in the, what I call contractarian model of contract, that old classical model of contract, you had rules such as the Ray Feel and Hans rule that rights in the memo and articles were enforceable among our companies and the Hickman and Rod, Ron Marsh rule that is the memo and articles constitute a contract between the company and each member, the company could enforce the articles against each member and Pender and Lushington given the opposite of, of this which is that the company could enforce against the member. But what are we seeing here? We're seeing classical contract, the, the boundaries of, of company law, uh, obligations, rights and obligations are bounded by uh, 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 contract considerations. As a matter of fact, if you remember, you know, cast your minds back, this is a long time ago, because most of us don't pay uh, much attention to, to this, to, to, to the statutory contract anymore. But the big question was whether outsiders' rights could be vindicated uh, by even a member of the, of the company. And 
that was a question that that is a question that still remains wide open but why is it why was that such a big question it was such a big question because of the primitive contract a, a principle that is an outsider can't get rights under the uh, under the, the the contract or cannot claim any rights under the contract so that is was what classical contract law bequeathed or or gave to um, con company law uh, 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 theory, classical company law theory. Now, the oppression remedy provision provisions have completely appended the common law approach to remedying wrongs done to shareholders and other stakeholders. If you could have, if you could have the the thing displayed again, that that provision displayed again, I can't see it. Ishmael? If you could share it, yes. Wonderful. Not, not this one, the other one, sorry. This one. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Peter, uh, welcome. Uh, I remember the great days we had together. Uh, welcome to the session. But to look at tip, not 225B, that one. Thank you very much. Uh, if you look at it, you'll see, first of all, there's a creature called a complainant. So he's the one who can apply to the court. Uh, and if you look at the persons who are protected by the remedy, it is not only shareholders who would be your quintessential contractors, but it also includes the venture holders, it can, uh, creditors and directors of the company. So you can see, thank you very much, um, uh, Ishmael. You can see that the remedy deals a, a severe blow to the classical contract the classical company law theory of contractual uh, of contractual obligations and rights, rights and obligations. Now, the, the so so let's look to see what therefore the oppression remedy represents. We've said it uh, doesn't represent the old contract theory of rights and obligations. Now, if you look at, there's a, a Canadian case called West, West Fair Foods, and what? I'm going to make these cases available to you at the end of um, the uh, submission, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to uh, 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 sort of um, use up time by giving ref case references at this point in time. But this is a case where uh, Mr. Justice of Appeal, Karens, expressed the opinion that the oppression remedy provisions are nothing more than compendi a compendious way for Parliament saying to the courts that the classes protected, the classes which I've just uh, drawn to your attention by the Act, are to be fairly and justly treated. Now, this is very important because in traditional company law theory, fairness and justice are to be judged by what is expressed in the articles of, associate, of association because these are the contracts which you've entered into. This is a throwback, as I, as I said before, to the Adam Smith enlightened self-interest idea of fairness and justice, that is that if you, that each person knew best what was in his best interest, and if he contracted for it, if he consented for it, then who was the court to say that that was not fair and just? And just. It didn't matter how improvident the, 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 the term, but the critical thing was, was there a contract? If there was a contract, then everything was fair and just. What the oppression remedy is, is doing is 
removing that and allowing the courts to look to see whether the protected class, and as I said before, when you look at the protected class, the protected class is a very large class. It's a, a diverse class, a class which goes way beyond uh, uh, cut the, cut the parties to the contract. So fairness and justice uh, uh, introduced by the oppression remedy uh, has to be looked at as an equitable uh, remedy rather than the legal remedy, which are uh, typically available for breach of contract. Now, I know that some of the Jamaicans and Moss may very well be saying that the theoretical analysis which I've just entered into doesn't apply to Jamaica because Section 191 of the Jamaican Act retains the traditional notion that the Articles of Incorporation in Jamaica constitute a statutory contract. I don't think I have to read the, 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 the Section 191. I think that we can agree, we can stipulate. It does. There, there's such a, a provision, the, which is a hark back to the old uh, English provision or notion of a statutory contract. So how do I square everything which I've been saying in relation to the oppression remedy? How do I square it with uh, the provision in Section 19.1 of the Jamaican Act? Now, <laughs> I, I discussed this with a friend of mine who is an evolutionary biologist, and he drew my attention to what he referred to as a vestigial uh, 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 relic. Uh, and he gave, an, as an example, uh, uh, the appendix. The appendix is there. You, you don't know what is the use of it, but it is there. I, I'm reminded also of a Bajan Calypso, where uh, the Calypsonian claims that, uh, let's, let's say Mary, Mary left him, but he holding on to she's skirt. Now, the point I'm making is that is Section 191 anything more than that? Is it, is it, isn't it just hanging on to classical contract theory? Uh, if you have the oppression remedy, which, which, which you do in, in Jamaica, if the act has that, has it, what, what's, how, does it, how do you square section 19.1 with section 213A of the Jamaican Companies Act, which is the oppression remedies uh, 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 provision? Now, I had a discussion with uh, Suzanne as well, um, in relation to Section 213A, because what you notice is that the Jamaican Companies Act appears to have been drafted and the oppression remedy was not part of the draft which apparently went to, to Parliament for the first time. Because if you look at the oppression remedy provision, it is in a Section 213A which is an add-on to section 213. And that's the technique which is used in drafting to, to introduce a, a, a section which modifies the earlier sections. And if the Jamaican Act had taken on board the oppression remedy, then as has happened, as had happened in all the other ter territories, of course, outside of um, St. Kitts, uh, the oppression remedy will have occupied a specific provision. But in my view, Section 19.1 does not detract from the oppression remedy in, 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 in Jamaica. I think that the same kind of analysis, which one brings the, the oppression remedy in the other territories, has to be brought to the um, uh, to the oppression remedy in, in Jamaica. And uh, 
the Section 19 has to be viewed, certainly from the perspective of um, the oppression remedy, has to be viewed as, as the Calypso says, uh, the Section 19 holding on to she dress or skirt as the case may be. Now, let's go to the remedy itself. These are the theoretical underpinnings of the remedy, but let's go to the uh, remedy itself and let's try to analyze the remedy to get uh, some uh, notion of how the remedy actually operates. I, I, I would like to address the, the, in, in this regard the first question, to whom is the remedy available? And if you throw your minds back to uh, the relevant section, that's um, the typical section, and the section one, which says a complaint, so that the oppression remedy is made available on the express language of the provision to a complainant. complainant. Sorry. But who is a complainant? I suggest that uh, if you look at um, Section 225B of the Barbados Act, yes, Ishmael, if you could display it for me, please. Yes. Uh, I'm using Section 225B of the Barbados Act because this is, a tip, this is typical in all the other uh, 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 territories. Uh, and it is most easily accessible to me. That's why I'm using the Barbados Act, but I could, view, could have used the Trinidadian Act or the uh, Dominican Act or the Grenadian Act. It wouldn't really matter. This is typical. And you see who, how a complainant is defined. It is defined by who it includes. Uh, and it includes shareholders, the bench shareholders, director, officers, registrar, any other person who in the discretion of the court is a proper person to make an application to the court. Now, that is very, very broad. That uh, 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 the fourth uh, person who qualifies as a complainant is extremely broad. It gives the court a, a, a discretion to decide who other than shareholders, the bench holders, directors, and so on uh, would, uh, can be included. Now, again, if you look at section 213.3 of the Jamaican Act, what you'll find is that two of the categories which are identified in the typical uh, the 225B of Barbados, that these are absent from the, the Jamaican Act. So uh, the registrar is, is, is not included, and the very wide provision of uh, any other person who the discretion of the court, that is, um, that is not included as well. Now, I have theorized, but my Jamaican friends can, can uh, you know, can put me right. But I've theorized that given section 19.1, which is attempting to keep very narrow the persons who will be eligible to company law remedies, that the fourth category, any other person who in the discretion of the court, that that would be uh, something which goes well beyond what Section 19 could tolerate. So I am seeing an attempt by the Jamaican legislators to introduce some doctrinal coherence between the complainant and the Section 19.1, which constitutes the Articles of Incorporation a contract. Um, I, I don't know that this is so, but um, from the, my horizon, which is a theoretical horizon, I'm surmising that this perhaps is the, is, is the reason. The whole point, though, is that you will see that the expression complainant constitutes a novel legal category in regional company law. It appears to be intended to protect the interests of not only shareholders, but also so of other stakeholders, such as creditors, management, and the public in general, and include 
even say for instance env environmental uh, 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 groups and say for instance Barbados and the remainder of the Caribbean which where you have the provision any other person who in the interest of, who in the discretion of the court and so on uh, I don't think that this is possible in Jamaica uh, because as far as I'm aware that those provisions have not been added to a section 213 uh, 2123 sorry uh, by way of a amendment I haven't, I haven't seen it okay so when is the remedy available? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ishmael. The, I would suggest that um, if you look at the remedy again, and if you bring to mind the typical provision uh, which we, we looked uh, time and time again, you, you'll agree with me that the kernel of the oppression remedy uh, provisions is that the conduct complained of must be actionable conduct in the sense that it must be oppressive or unfairly prejudicial or that it unfairly disregards the interests of the shareholder or the other persons mentioned as a complainant. Sorry, the other persons mentioned in the uh, protected group in the relevant section. There are therefore two central focal points in determining entitlement to the oppression remedy. These are, one, the interests of the protected category, and secondly, the conduct that is oppressive, unfairly prejudicial, or unfairly disregards that interest. So you have, first of all, to establish the, that there's an interest in the protected category which uh, can be, which can suffer from oppressive conduct, and the oppressive conduct has to be, there has to be evidence when you're proving the oppressive conduct of oppression, unfair prejudice, or unfair disregard in all uh, territories. Uh, now, since 2016, sorry, 17 in Jamaica, and the Jamaican Amendment, Okay, so we know that um, in an oppression remedy claim, then two things have to be established. The first is uh, actionable interest. That is, the protect you have to establish an interest which is uh, protected by the, uh, by, the, by the section. When you look at the language of the section, the language used is interest. And the leading Canadian case of BCE Incorporated and 1976 debentures holders, when you look at that case, you'll see that that case lays down very firmly that the oppression remedy provisions must be interpreted in light of the purpose of the oppression remedy itself. So this takes us back to uh, what I looked at, the roots of the, the, the historical roots of the, of the remedy. And when you look at the historical roots of, uh, of, of the relevant section, what you'll notice is that the, the, the whole purpose of the section is to free the court from technical considerations of legal rights and to confer on the court a wide power to do what appears to the court to be just and equitable. So that the purpose of the oppression remedy is to provide a just and equitable remedy uh, for the interests of persons in the protected class. Now, the Canadian cases have looked at the expression interest and have insisted that the interest includes reasonable expectations. That when one speaks of interest in, in 
terms of the, within the contemplation of um, the oppression remedy, that one is really talking about reasonable expectations. I, I wish to suggest that this concept of reasonable expectations is a, is a, is a, is a difficult one. And I'm aware that um, all of the cases make reference to reasonable expectations, but I would want to suggest that if you look at the remedy itself, the remedy, if you look at the, what the remedy is uh, based on, if you go back to the 20, sorry, sorry to the relevant section, sent to 10 of the uh, 1948 companies, uh, the remedy is about just, uh, just what is just and equitable. So for me, when one talks about reasonable, this is an objective standard which does not sufficiently capture, in my respectful view, the justice and equity which the oppression remedy is attempting to protect. So on some other occasion, if Tracy and the Mona Law will allow me, I may have an opportunity to discuss the whole question, the, the whole concept of reasonable expectations. One agrees that the remedy protects, the oppression remedy protects expectations, but the question is, is what kinds of expectations? I'm suggesting that um, reasonable expectations in, in the question and answer sessions, I guess that we can explore this a little bit more, but I'm suggesting that the uh, the, 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 the interest which is protected should be the equitable expectations rather than the reasonable expectations. And this is a lot more than parsing words. Uh, I think that um, as uh, Lord Hoffman, in the case of Ibrahimi, as he pointed out, what the court is looking at in the circumstances of um, just, just an equitable jurisdiction, what one is looking at is to see whether, quote unquote, equitable considerations modify or, sorry, are allowed to modify rights or qualify rights or other provisions in the corporate uh, uh, document. Constating document. But nevertheless, the language is the language of um, reasonable expectation. And this has begged the question whether reasonable expectations include the wider public law concept of legitimate expectations. Now, in the English Court of Appeal case of Resol. D. Harrison and Sons, PLC. Lord Justice, Justice Hoffman, as he then was, suggested that it did, that reasonable expectations are included legitimate expectations. However, in the English, the later English House of Lords decision of O'Neill and Phillips, by then Lord Hoffman had moved from the uh, Court of Appeal to the House of Lords, and he admitted that his suggestion in Resol was, to quote his language, probably a mistake. Instead, he suggested a shift from the public law language of legitimate expectations to the more traditional private law terminology of constraining the exercise of legal rights by reference to equitable uh, considerations. But what is surprising is that uh, in the Grenadian case of um, Grenada General Insurance Company against General Insurance Services Limited, the Grenada Court of Appeal cited Lord Hoffman in O'Neill and Phillips, but nevertheless, the Grenadian Court of Appeal decided the case 
on the basis that the, there was a legitimate expect, quote unquote, legitimate expectation, and as such, uh, this was protect, protected under the uh, interest uh, rule in the relevant provision in, in, the, in the Grenadian Act. I want to suggest that that is position is not free from difficulty. That uh, decision in, in Grenada General Insurance, I think that the decision itself is right, is correct. If you read the judgment, uh, the, the facts of the case and the judgment, you'll see that the, the, there's nothing wrong with the decision. It's how it's rationalized. Uh, it, 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 I, I don't think that um, uh, it, the case should have relied on legitimate expectation. And this is after Lord Hoffman recognized that he was wrong in the earlier cases, uh, in the earlier case of Resol. So that is the first uh, limb of the oppression remedy which has to be proved if you're gonna access the oppression remedy. The first limb is that you have to uh, establish what I call actionable and actionable interest. The other uh, limb is that you have to establish that there was a conduct uh, which can give rise to uh, the oppression remedy. Now, when you look at the provision, and we've looked at it a, a couple of times, you'll see that there are three categories of conduct which are made actionable by the relevant uh, company provisions. The first is oppressive conduct, uh, and the second is unfairly prejudicial conduct, and the third is unfair uh, disregard. Now we can quickly look to see what these what these mean. Uh, and oppressive conduct has been uh, described by Lord Simmons in the English House of Lords case of Scottish Cooperative Wholesale Society and Mayor to mean quote unquote burdensome, harsh, and wrongful conduct. So oppressive conduct is, as you can see, uh, extreme uh, conduct, burdensome, harsh, and wrongful. And I, I think, uh, Lord Simmons' uh, description of the oppression, of what is meant by oppression, has been widely accepted in Canadian cases, and I would suggest would also be followed in uh, Cur uh, Caribbean, Commonwealth Caribbean cases as well. Now, unfair prejudice or, or unfairly prejudicial conduct is not as stringent as oppressive conduct. And in most cases, it, is, it has been held to mean conduct complained of, which may not be burdensome, harsh, and wrongful, and therefore, oppressive, but which is nevertheless unfairly pre prejudicial. Now, this you may claim is hardly helpful, but it does establish a standard where there is clearly uh, conduct which, is which, is, which appears to be actionable. The court can look at that conduct, and even though it is not oppressive, Nevertheless, oh, sorry, even though it does not constitute oppression within the first meaning of oppression in the oppression remedy section, even though it doesn't satisfy that standard, it can satisfy the lower standard of unfair uh, prejudice or unfairly prejud pre uh, prejudicial uh, uh, conduct. Now, I could uh, give you a, a number of a list of the uh, examples of which one finds in the cases, but I'll just give you a, a couple very quickly. Uh, cases where the unfairly prejudicial uh, uh, conduct has been uh, held to be satisfied. There are cases where shareholders are excluded from the management or removed from the board, where the controlling shareholders made adverse changes to existing shareholders' rights, and such cases are cases where the courts have held uh, that the standard or 
of, of unfairly prejudicial conduct has been met. The third category is the category of unfair disregard. And we can deal with, with, with this very uh, uh, quickly because if you look at the case of Stetchin Davis, this is a case which is uh, universally accepted as uh, correctly defined in what is unfair disregard. Uh, it interpreted, that, that case interpreted unfair disregard to mean, quote and unquote, unjustly or without cause, paying no attention or to ignore or to treat as of no importance the interests of the security holders, creditors, directors, or officers. So this is a, a, a level of conduct which is lower than oppression and lower than unfair, unfair disregard, sorry, than unfair prejudice. And what you'll find is that there's a, in most of the cases, in lots of the cases, there's a lot of overlap between unfair prejudice and unfair disregard. The court often finds the two together. Now I'm, I know I'm running at the time, but um, I'd, quickly, I'd like quickly to look at the question of the orders which the court uh, uh, can make. And just to, uh, this is to further the observation that the oppression remedy is uh, undermining the classical company law theory and the because if you look at classical company law, the remedy, the range of remedies which are available to the court are very, very limited. They're usually thought to be limited to things like recovery of damages, injunctions, and declarations. But when you look at the uh, oppression remedy sections in the various um, uh, uh, companies up, what you'll find is that the courts are granted wide powers to make interim or final orders or any orders which the court thinks fit to remedy oppression. And there are a whole set of orders which are uh, set out in the act. I wouldn't go through them now, but uh, to mention two, so that you can see that these, these, these remedies are, uh, have gone way past what classical uh, company law would give us remedies, for instance, appointing directors in place of or in addition to the directors who are then in office or uh, they can amend the articles, can, uh, the court can order that the article, articles be, and bylaws be amended. Uh, so these are remedies which would not normally be available because of the, under, classic, under the classical contract theory, because of the, the restriction which the notion of contract uh, impo would impose on, uh, on the, rem the available remedies. I'd just like to mention quickly uh, three rules that obtain in respect of the oppression remedy. The first is relate, relates to the object of the orders. And the object of an oppression remedy is expressly stated in the acts to be to rectify oppressive conduct, the oppressive uh, 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 conduct complained of. And the cases have insisted that the remedy, the order should go no further than is necessary to rectify the existing oppression. <clears throat> Sorry. I, I think that um, it would be useful to note a second, uh, a rider to this rule which is that the oppression, the, the, the oppressive conduct may be in the past, but if the oppression itself, if the result of the, or the consequence of the oppress, oppressive uh, conduct continues uh, to the date of the trial, then uh, the court can give an order to rectify the oppressive conduct, which is, which is continuing, even though the oppressive sorry, the oppressive consequence, which is continuing, even though the oppressive conduct ha has finished. And the third thing which I want to note 
is uh, because of the Barbados decision in a case called Cox and Roberts. This was a case where the court held that there was no oppression, but nevertheless went on to give an oppression remedy. Now, uh, I would like to suggest that that, is, that, well, that, that case is, is incorrectly uh, decided because the clear purpose of the oppress, oppression remedy is to remedy oppression. And if you've decided that there's no oppression, it's difficult to see how you can make an order uh, to remedy the oppression which you didn't find. I'd like to, before, in the next uh, two minutes, uh, because I'm, I'm about to close, in the next two minutes, I'd just like to mention uh, three special rules which one finds in the legislation uh, relating to the oppression remedy and which I think strengthen the oppression remedy. Uh, some may think, not surprisingly, these rules are not found in the, in the Jamaican Act. But the first rule is special rule relates to uh, shareholder ratification of alleged breach, breaches which give rise to an application for oppression. And if there are alleged breaches by uh, the directors which uh, have given reason to the oppression, to the application for oppression remedy, then there's a relevant section in the various uh, uh, territories which state that if the majority of shareholders attempt to ratify the activity, the action of the directors, that that uh, would not uh, be, uh, that would not su suffice. You cannot, by uh, vote of the majority, ratify conduct which is complained of as being um, oppressive. The second uh, rule with, to, to which I want to refer is the settlement of oppression action rule and to discourage strike suits, uh, to extort financial settlements from, from corporate management. There are provisions in regional acts, not in Jamaica, which provide for the courts to supervise settlement of oppression actions before trial. So this is an, an attempt to uh, prevent persons from uh, brain actions and then attempting to force the hand of management into um, uh, paying uh, or settling the action before it reaches the court. And the third, uh, the third special rule to which I wish to, to, to draw attention, again, this rule doesn't obtain in, in Jamaica. Uh, there is provision in the Acts uh, that a complainant who institutes an oppression action may be given by the court interim costs to allow the pursuit of the complainant action. Now there are certain criteria which the courts have uh, used to determine whether the interim cost will be, uh, an interim cost order will be made. And basically there are two uh, things which the court will look at. First, whether the applicant has established that there's a case of sufficient merit to warrant pursuit. And the second is uh, that the applicant is in financial need. So that these two things would have to be satisfied by the applicant before he will be awarded or a cost order, will, uh, interim cost order will be made in his favor. So let me conclude by observing that the provisions in the Companies Act in the region on the oppression, on oppression remedy follow the trend in modern company legislation to provide increasing protection to minority shareholders. 
and other stakeholders against abuse of the majority rule by granting new rights and remedies to minority shareholders and other stakeholders. The oppression provisions have achieved this by significantly undermining traditional company law theory that company law rights are to be determined on contract principles. And I'm so, saying so, even if the Jamaican Act appears to be a bit reticent in this regard. It's, as I've said before, I think that the Jamaican Act is in the same position as um, the other acts by and large. So let me thank you very much for attending this session. And I expect nothing less than a thorough interrogation of, my, of the views expressed by me uh, in this short presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Justice Burgess. <laughs> it, I'm riveted. Uh, we, I know that we all could sit at your feet for the next couple hours again, but we, it was wonderful and I thank you so much. I thank you for just a quick um, recap, taking us through the history and the whole idea of upending what existed before. And I had the privilege and the benefit of your teaching when all of this was unfolding and we were following the um, Canadian model. Um, I also am grateful for your uh, attempt to reconcile the Jamaica Act and uh, particularly Section 19, and as you put it, holding on to she skirt or she dress, and at the same time recognizing um, the developments that have occurred in our Act, the Jamaica Act, that is especially in regard to the oppression remedy. And of course, you and I can argue about this another time. I'm very excited about um, your explanation or your, um, recon your attempt to reconcile. Um, also, the concepts of uh, legitimate expectation and reasonable expectation. And I have to tell you, I paused because your, de your description of it perhaps that it should be an equitable expectation um, is actually relatively new to me, although I know that there's some case law, which we can talk about again another time, that seems to suggest that as well. And we have some questions on that in the chat. So that's very exciting. And then the conduct that could give rise to, to oppression. And you going through each discrete um, element, whether it's oppression, unfair prejudice, and so on, and um, I, and what is helpful and what is hardly helpful. And um, I, I really embrace that because uh, my approach to teaching this area is to stick with these di di dictionary definitions, which may be hardly helpful. And then, of course, the remedies to go no wider than the traditional company law, generally speaking, but then it does. So nice. And finally, um, your observation about the three rules, which sadly, I thought it was St. Kitts who bought for St. Kitts, but now we're bought for Jamaica. Um, but we're grateful for, for that instruction as well. And so with that, um, I'm going to open the floor to questions. And um, I have some burning ones, but I have to yield on this occasion. And I go first to our Zoom um, group chat. And I would ask uh, the Honorable Michael Hilton, uh, OJQC, to uh, perhaps pose a question that he may have for you. Mike? Thanks, Susan. Um, Justice Burgess. Congratulations for an excellent, thought-provoking paper. Um, you keep doing this. Every time I think I understand an area, 
you, you raised some questions I hadn't thought of. Two observations, questions. Um, when, when our present Companies Act was being developed, I wore another more public sector hat. Um, don't purport to take any credit for it or to speak for them, but the question that you raise about having the narrower definition of complainant and the possibility that that might be explained by the fact that we kept 19.1 and tried to get some, I don't know, doctrinal coherence, I very much doubt that that was the case. Um, I, that ship sailed. <laughs> so so there, there's no doctrinal coherence as it is now. Um, I, I really think that it was just a question of a narrower definition. And I, I, I confess that that wider definition, which allows the court to add any one day thing fit, I struggle with a, li a little, and I'd really be interested in, in hearing how that has been applied in other jurisdictions and whether it has been considered to be beneficial. Um, because I, as I say, I, I think it was just that that seemed too wide. I, I don't think it has anything to do with, with 1901. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mike. That's a, that's a, a, a very interesting uh, uh, observation and, and question as well. Uh, I, I, I have to admit that I passed the, the thing of um, doctrinal coherence by, <laughs> by, by Suzanne. And she, like you, assured me that um, this was the furthest <laughs> Doctrine was the furthest thing away from the minds of, of the drafters uh, in, in, in Jamaica. Uh, but uh, I wasn't there, so therefore I have to find, a, I have to find some theoretical re reason for, for it. Anyhow, but the question that you raise is, is, a, is, 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 is a good one. Any, the, the wider uh, uh, concept or, or provision in the complainant remedy provision, which is not present in Jamaica, which is any other person who in the discretion of the court. Now, in uh, a Barbadian case called um, Canves, uh, early case actually, one of the earliest cases in Barbados on the oppression remedy, the shareholder, sorry, the, the, the person, the complainant who, or the intended complainant, who was bringing the case before the court had been promised that he would have bet shares would have been issued to him in a company which was to be formed. That the company was formed and no shares were issued to him. Now he could therefore not sue as a shareholder. But the court looked at the any other person. Uh, a provision who, who in the discretion of the court looked at that provision and said, looking at the totality of the circumstances, this is some person who did work on the belief that he was going to, that shares were going to be issued to him and so on. And the court uh, used that provision to um, include him or to allow him to, to apply for the oppression remedy as a, as a complainant. There's another Barbadian case as well called Amerci, uh, which is also one of the earlier cases as well, where the attorney general was allowed to sue uh, on behalf of the government. Now, if you look at the strict provisions in the complainant law uh, uh, provisions, you'll see it's shareholders, debenture holders, directors, registrar. This is in Barbados and any other person who in the interest of, um, uh, in the discretion of the court. In that case, the court held that the interest of the public of Barbados was at stake. And that this was a case where the court, notwithstanding the fact that the attorney general was not a person <clears throat> named as a complainant, that he would be allowed <clears throat> to bring a complainant remedy uh, before, sorry, complainant application before, before the court. So those are two circumstances, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking, uh, you know, Mike, I'm thinking of a situation where you have, say, for instance, a project being done by um, a, a, a company, and it has significant environmental uh, 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 repercussions. 
Now, uh, why shouldn't uh, it's their environmental group, let's say, for instance, the environmental group, why couldn't it, why shouldn't it be allowed to sue under, it, under the complainant uh, remedy provision as a person whose interest is being violated? Can I say, though, um, Andrea, instinctively, I would think that that is an issue better dealt with in a constitutional law kind of claim, if not a private law kind of claim, rather than a company um, construct. Instinctively, that would be my reaction. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is that uh, the, the, a similar question arose in um, a Trinidadian case called Five Stars, uh, where um, a contract existed between uh, the Trinidadian Telephone Company and some electric company, sorry, and a, 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 another contracting party, a per person who had bought electricity from the the telephone, sorry, the T-Tech, the Electricity Commission. Uh, the Electricity Commission uh, uh, withdrew certain services from the, uh, compla the intended complainant, and the intended complainant sued under the oppression, claimed that that behavior was oppressive. And rather than suing on the, on the basis of contract, he sued on the basis of the uh, oppression remedy uh, provision. Now, this is Justice Vett, nor who was the judge in that case, is the Trinidadian case, held, yes, that he was a complainant. Now, like you, I don't think that that is right. I think that he was, he was restricted to his, the, the, the complainant remedy, certainly the, the oppression remedy, in my view, doesn't uh, deal with a case like that. But for me, what it deals with is stakeholder rights, not only shareholder rights, but stakeholder rights. And I think that there is a, that there's a, a understanding uh, in modern uh, jurisprudence that um, environmental, certain environmental rights, I agree with, with you that uh, certain environmental rights are be better dealt with uh, in the public law forum. But if you have a private company, which is inflicting private uh, prejudice on a private citizen, uh, I find it a little difficult to see how you're going to invoke the Constitution uh, in that situation. Um, thank you for that. Thank you, Mike, for that question. And um, before I go on to the next question, might I suggest, Justice Burgess, that perhaps because these environmental groups or whoever is not a member of the victim class as stated in the section and the victim class being more limited than the complainant class, perhaps that's why they shouldn't get a remedy. But I leave that there. <laughs> very, very interesting. That's a, that's a very interesting thing. But you have to, my, I have to respond to it because I suggest to you that, yes, uh, you call them victim. I call them the protected class. Uh, the, 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 the thing is that that's, that's not where you decide. That's not where you decide whether you have standing, whether you, you, can, you have standing as a complainant. Where you decide whether you have standing as a complainant is under the, under the complainant uh, uh, provision. And the question is therefore, am I included under that? If you have, in Jamaica, I agree with you. In Jamaica, you don't stand on it. You don't, you don't stand a chance. But in Barbados, uh, I, I'm, and the remainder of the Caribbean, I'm wondering aloud, I'm not, I'm not answering, but I'm wondering aloud whether you could not claim to be a person who in the discretion of the court should be held to be included in that class. I think that's how Canada dealt with it. <laughs> um, Celia, just before, um, I think Sandra Minot Phillips had a question in the Zoom group and then we can go to the YouTube. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thank, thanks, Suzanne. Uh, the oppression remedy causes me quite a bit of disquiet um, because it, of its capacity to, as it were, drive a coach and four through 
the established concept of majority prevails, which is what should happen in a company that is um, made up of shareholders. So when you have this capacity to upend the established order of things, then chaos can ensue. So in my view, I would go so far as to say it should be done away with, but it should be, yes, it gives very wide powers. But to my mind, great care should be taken by the judiciary to ensure that those very wide powers are utilized within a very narrow um, corridor. And that is the corridor where the complainant establishes that the conduct complained of is oppressive or unfair, but from an objective standpoint, not from the point of view necessarily of one side or the other. But the court has to take great care to take an objective approach to this complaint. Otherwise, what you have is a provision that can weaponize a coup d'etat by the minority over the majority. And that is never something that is to be encouraged in a free and democratic society. That's my contribution. That, that's, uh, uh, Sandra, that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent observation. Uh, I would, I would, I would uh, look at it this way. Uh, when we look at modern companies, if, if you look at, for instance, uh, let's say the, the average uh, large company, the company trading on the stock exchange, the, the shareholders, they have very little power. They have very little, I mean, they invest what? Admittedly, it's not going to be the major part of the investment in the company, but they invest what they invest in the company. Now, I'm wondering whether uh, they are not like the, in a position which is not dissimilar from, say, for instance, the consumer who goes to the, uh, whatever, to the, to, the <clears throat> to the distributor or whoever, and he's handed a contract and He's told to sign on the dotted line and he signs and later on finds out, not, having not read it and so on, uh, finds out that it is, that the thing is, uh, you know, very adverse to his, to, to his interest, but he's caught. Consumer law has, has, has come in, in Jamaica I, I, as well as in Barbados and you have, uh, those are, it's dealt with. Now it's the little share, is the little shareholder or other stakeholder, is he in any different a position from the consumer or should his interest be protected and if if his interest should be protected will contract protect it or do you need a mechanism a different mechanism some other mechanism i agree with you that the oppression remedy has to be carefully applied but you stop short of saying that it should be done away with and i think that you were wise not to want it done away with but they, what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm wondering is, uh, isn't this a, 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 a tool, a remedy, which is extremely useful? It is a remedy that's useful to prevent injustice. But we must first establish injustice is there and then use it. Because they, they, every share has the same amount of rights. Every share in the group has it, every shareholder. I mean, if one share is one voting right. So, so the, the company's law is designed that the person that holds a majority of shares, of course, would, would, would exercise control. And we need to be careful that we don't just tamper with that because the person has a minority interest. And uh, I, I don't think you're suggesting that that is, that is how the, the, the remedy should be used. But I am seeing an with the increasing number of oppression actions that are being brought. It is as if to say, because I am a minority shareholder, because I'm a director representing a minority interest, I, by virtue of that alone, have a right to claim that I should uh, be able to invoke one of these 
many extensive remedies available to me under Section 213 um, A. Yes, Andrew. Uh, if I may, Suzanne, I know that you are the uh, <laughs> undoubted expert on corporate gov governance, but uh, doesn't the oppression remedy how doesn't it have uh, salutary uh, consequences for proper co corporate governance? I, 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 I don't know. I'm just raising that question with you, Suzanne. Absolutely. And that is the point of the oppression remedy to, it, it, I noticed um, Justice Burgess, you emphasize the stakeholder concerns and our move to stakeholder protection in the widest sense. This is consistent with it. This is the whole point. Um, and so I, I would agree with you, although um, at the same time, I agree with you, Sandra, that it should be exercised with um, some caution or, or at least um, carefully. Susan, Susan, you're on the fence, but uh, we have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> we have some questions for, for Justice Burgess in the wider audience. Judge, before I go to these questions, and I have to ask you, I have to wonder why it is that you haven't offered the exception to the privity doctrine as a basis for rationalizing the Section 19 one in Jamaica with, with, 20, with um, 213A, um, rather than, you know, resorting to the proverbial um, skirt tail of the, <laughs> of the notional Caribbean woman. But maybe we can pick that up after you have these questions um, directed to you. We have Nicholas Jackman who is asking, does a complainant need to show direct injury in seeking to rely on the oppression remedy? And I will just follow up with another one to put on your plate. Um, Professor Fiaggio is asking, is there really a meaningful distinction between reasonable expectations and um, equitable expectations or is it just academic sophistry? Yes, well, sorry. First of all, let me take uh, Professor uh, Fiaggio, and could you please tell him I send my, my greetings? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if, he's, if he can hear me, but if he can hear me, I send my greetings. And I'm not surprised that he would uh, want to colonize uh, private law with um, uh, uh, public law notions of, of legitimate ex expectation. Now, the, the thing is that um, Albert is, um, is uh, the on question expert in, in questions of, um, of uh, legitimate expectation and so on. I mean, um, so I'd have to give, this is public law, legitimate expectation. But as I understand it, it is, it is uh, fairly broad. It, it's a concept which is, which is very broad and which is, you could develop a legitimate expectation. For instance, if a minister, uh, uh, makes a statement uh, in public, and it is a, a statement which is intended to be heard by you, and you claim that your rights are affected. I, I think that legitimate expectation could be argued in a case which is as broad as that. Now, to my mind, when you're dealing with um, public law uh, remedies, you are dealing with uh, the... the the, the relationship between the uh, complainant or the applicant or whoever and the minister or the government official is not bounded in the way that uh, the relationship between stakeholders and uh, the company, that relationship is a bounded relationship. It's not a contract, it's not bound, bounded by contract. But there is, but there you, you have a constating document, and this uh, rights and liabilities are are contained within that. The expectations which are protected are the expectations which lie behind those uh, uh, provisions and rights and so on, which are contained in the document. So, I, I don't I don't think that there is a I don't think that there is a. a what he said, an exercise in sophistry is the, is the, is the, is the language you use. Uh, I, think it, I, think, I think that there's a real difference between the two. Uh, and I think that that real difference is captured by uh, what Suzanne uh, uh, made reference to earlier, but I made reference to it, equitable, uh, equitable expectations rather than, than reasonable expectations. I think that if you use the expression reasonable expectations, 
expectation, which the case is abused, that uh, Professor Fiyadro may have a point, uh, even though his authority, which would, be, which would normally be Lord Hoffman in Resol, was retracted by, sorry, by Lord Justice Hoffman in Resol, was rejected by Lord Hoffman in O'Neill and, and Phillips. So that would be my uh, answer to the, to the second question. And if you remind me of the first question, I'll... Uh, yes. Does a complainant need to show direct injury um, in seeking to rely on the oppression remedies? I don't think so. I think that um, I think, and this is something which I think um, uh, Suzanne was um, was 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 uh, making reference to earlier. Uh, the interest which has to be protected, the interest which has to be uh, offended, is the interest of some person, one of the persons in the I call it protected category. Uh, uh, what um, Suzanne calls victim class. That sounds too much like. Um, like social law to me, and not commercial law. <laughs> commercial law. So I refer, I prefer to refer to it as a, as the protected category. But uh, I, I know that there are some cases which refer to it as um, victim class. But I, I think that's a rather unfortunate uh, categorization. Uh, and I would, but so when I say protected class, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about what Suzanne, uh, the same thing as Suzanne when she uses the expression victim class. But so the answer is no. The complainant doesn't have to prove that he himself or he or she uh, themselves would, uh, was affected. A member of the, of the uh, protected class category uh, interest must have, been, must have been affected. Okay, just two follow-up questions. Um, Shireen Golden Campbell is asking, and maybe Suzanne, you can help Justice Burgess with this. Is it true that the 2017 amendments have not been relied on much. And um, the second question from Naila Robinson regarding the provision in the, um, well, not in Jamaica, but in the other statutes, any other person um, says that she has seen it, I've seen it argued that a clear line needs to be drawn between general civil actions and oppression actions. Do you think that the legislators intended otherwise? You see, Celia, you are challenging my age. You're giving me all of these questions, all of these questions together, and you're you you're suggesting that I should remember both of them. Why don't you give me the first one first and then the second one? Well, I'm going to ask Susan. Susan, maybe you want to weigh in on the first question, which is um, whether there's much reliance. There's been much reliance on the uh, 2017 amendments because that that affects Jamaica, I think. Um, we also have some other practitioners. Um, I don't know, Mike and uh, Sandra, if you can weigh in on this. Have you been seeing more? I just finished, I just finished the case using the 2017 amendments. Okay. Yes. And, and my comment would be, I think I, um, and I don't know if you'd agree with me, Justice Burgess, given the time that it takes for these, um, for the act, you know, we've seen a number of oppression cases, but it takes years before we take advantage of all. And in terms of oppression and unfair prejudice, I've seen an uptick in Jamaica um, recently um, to using these remedies, but I'm guided by Mike and Sandra on this. And, um, and I'll also add, so the amendments is one thing, but generally the section is being used, but it takes time for um, all, the, all of the section to be used. And I just also wanted to mention to Justice Burgess that even on the concepts of re reasonable expectation and legitimate expectation, um, our courts have used them and used them interchangeably, <laughs> um, which is interesting. Um, it's also interesting that O'Neill and Phillips is our old case. I'll leave it right there. <laughs> <laughs> if I can just add something quickly, um, I, I certainly agree with, Sus with um, Susan about the extent to which the remedy is being used. But the 2017 amendment introduced the unfairly disregards. And I certainly have not seen a case where that, that concept has been explored and the differences, if any, between it and unfairly prejudicial. And I don't know, if, um, Sandra, within your case it did, but that I have not seen. Yeah, it, was, it has been raised in my case. It's one of the limbs that is raised in my case. Okay. But my case is ongoing, so <laughs> it's not finished. 
I don't want to dominate. Sorry, Justice Burgess, I don't want to dominate that. But I also noticed that what has been happening, and I don't know if you agree throughout the Caribbean, that these cases say oppression, unfair prejudice, unfair disregard, and just throw all of them out and whatever sticks. <laughs> well, that's, the, that's the precise point I was going to, I was going to make, that un, unfair disregard is the lowest level. And I think that uh, Mike and, and, and Sandra, if they're on the other side, would certainly throw, as you correctly pointed out, would certainly throw all three of them out there. It was oppressive, it was unfairly prejudicial, and it was also unfair, unfairly disregarded the interest. So I, I, I'd be surprised, because that's the lowest standard, I'd be surprised if uh, uh, Sandra is not right, that it was... <laughs> I'm, the one, I'm, I'm the one that they are being thrown at. I know, I know. I, <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's Sandra. Um, Judge, I, I don't mean to be unfair to you. Yes. But there is another question. Um, uh, from David Ellis, who um, is asking, what is your view on the imposition of a limitation period for oppression remedies? And do you believe a limitation period should be imposed? Well, uh, uh, whether there's a limitation period, well, I, I think that the, uh, when do you begin to, when do you begin to calculate the limitation period? Certainly not from the date of the, of the oppressive conduct. If the oppressive, the effect of the oppressive conduct is continuing, uh, as long as that, uh, the results of the oppression, the oppressive conduct is continuing, uh, then you can bring an action before the, 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 the court for oppression to remedy the opp oppression which is existing. And that is the, uh, Privy Council decision in, um, in uh, what's the name of the recent Privy Council decision, Suzanne, you should remember, Galantis and Alexio. That, and that's, that's a decision, a 2019 decision, where the Privy Council emphasized that the question is not so much when did the oppressive, when did it occur? And I guess that the question which is raised by, you said, David, Mr. Mr. Ellis, that question uh, would make a lot of sense if the date of the commission of the of, uh, 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 oppressive conduct, if that was the relevant date. But the relevant date is the, the continuation of the oppressive, the, the results of the oppression. That is the critical, that's the critical question. Okay, and just to go back to the um, 2017 amendments, there's another, uh, well, the firm Henling, Gibson Henling here is saying that they have just completed a case using the 2017 amendments. So it's on the uptick, it seems. A question here, Judge, from Amber St. Rose, can the oppression remedy be used in contracts with a government in a situation where the contract terms with a body corporate were unfair and the party to the contract suffers losses. Uh, could you repeat that, please? Uh, the question is, can the oppression remedy be used in contracts with a government um, in a situation where the contract terms with a body corporate were unfair and the party to the contract suffers losses? Yeah, well, uh, uh, I think that um, in my answer to uh, Professor Fiaggio, I sort of suggested that um, those uh, public law remedies are available, usually available, uh, to uh, remedy maladministration and so on. Uh, I, I suspect that that would not be a situation where the oppression remedy could be invoked, because it's um, the, the oppression remedy is invoked for bad corporate behavior and not necessarily uh, bad governmental behavior. So my uh, uh, initial view would be to say that um, it wouldn't be available in that, in that circumstance. Uh, Suzanne, over to you. Is there anybody queued for a question? Maybe a last question from our, or inner audience, so to speak. Suzanne? Sorry, um, I'm just checking uh, my feed here. 
I'm seeing quite a few comments as opposed to, to questions. Um, again, on 2017 amendments, thank you for that, Tananya Small. Um, Naila Robinson's question, um, I'm not sure if you saw that, Celia. Um, any other person? Civil actions versus oppression actions, there should be a clear line. Justice Burgess, did you hear that? No, I didn't. A uh, clear line, what that clear line should be brought, uh, should be made between, should be drawn between general civil actions and oppression actions. Uh, I think that the, it, it's a good question. You said it's in Naila Robinson? Correct. Yeah, that's um, one of my uh, uh, students, one of my former students from Barbados here. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that the the the, the, the um, if you look at the provisions in in the the, the relevant oppression law uh, provision, that that itself draws a, a fairly that outlines what is embodied in the oppression remedy, and that is I think that in, in that way it you know in, insulates or certainly separates itself from other. Uh, 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 civil actions. Uh, the the oppression remedy is available within the definition of oppression as it is represented in the relevant uh, uh, provision. Uh, so it, 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 I don't think it allows itself to be, uh, 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 you know, commingle or or anything with um, other civil uh, remedies. The I don't know if um uh, uh, what um. Nella is making reference to, and she may very well, this is what she may be making reference to, is that the oppression remedy provision is found in most uh, territories on the, the part which is headed civil remedies. And the two civil remedies which are dealt with are the um, derivative action and the oppression action. Uh, but if the question she's raising whether there's overlap between the um, or whether there can be overlap between the oppression remedy and the derivative um, action, the answer is yes. That there have been there, there have been occasions where uh, parties have not been allowed to be a complainant in a, an oppression remedy, but have been allowed to be a complainant in a in the derivative action and vice versa. So that um, uh, the derivative action itself, which I must say is uh, uh, very well uh, uh, litigated in, in, um, in Jamaica. I must confess that the jurisprudence, uh, your now Chief Justice, uh, uh, if you, when once you can get past the length of those um, judgments, uh, are, 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 they're excellent. I, mean, I, I have to say to you that um, his, um, his uh, judgments on, in the, on the derivative, derivative action uh, I think that there are path-breaking uh, 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 judgments. But to back to Nyla's um, uh, question, whether the two can overlap. If, she, if this is what she's referring to, there, yeah, there, there, there is um, uh, legal as well as factual overlap. There may be, I'm not saying there is always, but there may be factual overlap uh, in, 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 in those, um, as well as legal overlap in those two civil remedies. Thank you, George. And um, we're gonna take two um, final questions. One is from one of our students, Rudy, and then we'll take the other from Mike Hilton. Um, so Rudy, can you go ahead, please? Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Justice Bages. I was simply wondering whether the cases that have been cited appear to show that there is a conflation of the standing requirement as to who can be held to be a complainant and the statutory remedy requirement. And that is to say, the courts have been, well, the, well, the courts have been statutorily provided with wide discretion as to who can be deemed to be a complainant. 
but they have a rather limited discretion, if, if any discretion at all, as to the category of protected persons. And so in that, in that regard, I have found that one can, if one was so minded, impugn the decisions in, in Can West in the same way that one can in Five Star, in the sense that the, the judge may have gone outside of the boundaries of the protected class, which Mr. Justice Jamada, as he then was, was careful to maintain in Lopez. So that although Justice Jamada granted standing in Lopez, he found that the, the remedy was not available statutorily because they were outside of the protected class. So I wanted to know what were your thoughts on standing versus the statutory remedy requirements. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you very much for that question. That's a very interesting question. But uh, I think that, um, I think that the, the answer really resides in, in your very observation. I think that um, this is my view. Perhaps it's, um, it, it's, you know, you can, you can comment on it then once I've given you my view. But the thing is that um, uh, complainant, what is a complainant is dealt with in a provision which deals with what is a complainant. That just gives you standing to then invoke the oppression remedy, which will require you to prove the various uh, uh, elements of the oppression remedy. Not because you're allowed to be a complainant or, give, or not because you're given standing means that that is the end of um, the, 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 the road. That's the first hurdle to get into court. The next hurdle is to convince the court that the remedy should be available to you. Now, when I made reference to the five-star uh, decision, and I must say that uh, I agree entirely with, um, with uh, Justice Damodar's decision in Lopez, I, I think it's an excellent uh, decision. Uh, the reason I made reference to five-star is that five-star was wrong in the sense that uh, this is the, you, you were still at the first hurdle. The first hurdle was the complainant uh, hurdle, could you get past the complainant hurdle? And not every contractor, because he was a, the, the relationship between the two parties was essentially a contractual uh, 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 relationship. Yes, the other part of the, to the contract was a company, but it had nothing to do with the, 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 the company behavior in relation to him in a uh, capacity other than a counterparty in, 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 in the contract. So I Agree. I understand the, the observation you're making. I think it's an excellent observation, but I think that you yourself have provided the, the answer by recognizing that the getting past the first hurdle doesn't uh, mean that that's the end of the, the, the story. You still have to deal with the, the second um, stage, which is actionable interest. You have to show an interest. And the second thing is that you have to show the conduct, actionable conduct. So that, I think, would be how I would respond to you. I don't know. Thanks. Thanks, Judge Mike. Um, thanks, um, Celia. Um, Andrew, I, I was very pleased to see you mention the Cops and Robbers case. And I wondered whether the Barbadian courts have had occasion to revisit that issue. <laughs> let, me, let me just confess. Let me just confess. I am I am presently involved in a case where one of the parties is arguing that the court can make a bail with order absent a finding of oppression or unfair prejudice. And and both both Justice Blackman's judgment and your critique are before the court. So that's not fair. <laughs> well, well I, I, I I don't want to put any money on on Justice Blackman. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I I, I don't know of any. There's only one. There's a Trinidadian case which I which I do not which I do not remember at this point in in time. But there is a Trinidadian case uh, where the Trinidadian courts actually cited uh, the Blackman case, the Cox case, uh, with approval. But I'm not certain it was on the granting an order where the oppression was not proved. It may have been on a different point. I think it was on a different point. But um, for me, I think that the decision itself is contaminated by, by the, the finding that you can 
you can uh, give a, a remedy for oppression, even where oppression is not proved. I mean, that, that seems to me to be, to be uh, but what is your own view, Mike? I mean, um, no, I share your view. I agree. I think that the, the acts and the remedies are, although they don't express the say so, are designed to protect minorities against oppressive conduct. Yes, or right. persons, but, yeah. that would be that would be my answer as well. And if I had to put a bet, that's the what I I'd bet on. I will send you the judgment when we get it. Yeah, please, please do, please do. Thank please. you very much, Suzanne. Over to you to wrap up. <laughs> Thank you, Celia. Um, Justice Burgess, Celia and I want to just sit here and bring our questions to you. We can't, so in the interest of time. But thank you so much. Just the, um, the volume of questions and the vibrancy of the discussion tells us everything. And so I know that we will need a part two, same time, same place. <laughs> in a few months or next year when Mike and, and Sandra and all these other participants have their judgments in hand and, um, and we'll take it from there. But in the meantime, I will hand it over to Liz Kelsick to say a few words. Well, folks, this has been such a treat. I am absolutely delighted to be able to give the vote of thanks to the illustrious Mr. Justice Andrew Burgess. I am a graduate of um, the UKFL UWI um, Law Faculty, 1984. And so Andrew, as we called him, or Burgess, was my law tutor and lecturer. And it's such a thrill to know that Andrew's formidable, considerable teaching skills are still being put to good use. Uh, this was fascinating because, as you said, the, the, the St. Kitts Companies Act doesn't have these remedies, but I, like a good student, went to my nearest company ordinance and, and I followed you along. And it, it, was, it was delightful to, to be taught by you again, um, Justice Burgess. Um, you know, the, the teaching profession is, I think, one of the most noble professions. And Andrew Burgess is one of the very best. Um, you know, at the law faculty, um, Andrew's revenue law class was legendary. We, I mean, his classes were not just intellectually stimulating, but they were fun because Andrew encouraged us as students to think for ourselves, to think outside the box. There's no box. He, did, he encouraged us to disagree with him when we thought that he was wrong, to disagree with others in the class. So he gave us confidence as young people, as lawyers, as potential lawyers, you want lawyers yet, to, to expand. And that is a gift that only a really confident, good teacher can give. Andrew's ego was never in play. And so we as students really, truly enjoyed his classes. And I'm going to um, go back to a little bit of history, which is important to me, if I may. Um, in, 1960, in June 1963, the University of the West Indies Council set up a committee under the chairmanship of Sir Hugh Wooden to consider the question of legal education in the Caribbean to make recommendations. And my late father, Frederick Kelsig, was appointed to represent the Leeward Islands. Now, the, 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 that, that group of, 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 of lawyers who met actually produced a it's called the Report on the Committee of Legal Education. It's, you, can get it, you can get it in, out of the law library. And that's how the law faculty of, of the, the West Indies came about in 1970. And Andrew was one of the first students. Now, why I'm mentioning this is because when my late father died, he wanted a gift to be given to Yui, an annual prize. And so it is no accident that the prize, the Frederick, Ed, Frederick E. Kelsick Memorial Prize was given to the most outstanding student in revenue law, because that was my way 
of acknowledging this extraordinary teacher, really a, a, a teacher above all. And so Andrew Justice, Mr. Justice Burgess, <laughs> I would like, on behalf of all of the LLM students, I would like, on behalf of all of those who you've taught, all the lawyers for the Caribbean whose lives you have made a difference to, not just as a teacher, but as a dean of the Faculty of Law, I would like to thank you very much for your outstanding contribution to the teaching of law in the Commonwealth Caribbean. We are all better for having you with us. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Liz. Thank you very much, Liz. Oh, um, Justice Burgess, uh, you know how we all feel. We are really grateful for this time and we look forward to part two. And so with that, I would like to thank you and bring our session to a close. But while as I'm closing, I'd also like to thank all our esteemed guests, participants, LLM students, the Deputy Dean, Tracy Robinson, who has brought such life to the Office of the Deputy Dean of Graduate Studies, um, Celia Blake, doc, Dr. Celia Blake for co-moderating, and Hutchinson and Neil Preston for your usual brilliance in the IT and administration. Um, department of the Masterclass series. So thank you again. And if anyone else have forgotten, please forgive me. But thanks again. And we look forward to all who joined us this evening, whether on Zoom or on YouTube. Uh, we look forward to um, having you back with us. So thank you again, Justice Burgess. Thank you very much, um, Susan. <laughs> <laughs>